Okay, thanks for the invitation. And this, uh, this is now the third lecture, third and final lecture of the mini course. And I will talk about domain specific languages of mathematics uh, today. And I will have a few slides about limits of functions and towards derivatives. And then we'll go to some live coding of uh, another domain specific language. We, we did the example of complex numbers yesterday, and we will do the example of uh, simple one argument functions and symbolic derivatives today. So as uh, for the uh, previous example, we start with a math book quote, the limit of a function. So this is again from Adams and Essex. Um, and this is not supposed to be something new. It's just uh, some, something you might remember from long ago or so. Then, and we try to tease this apart and see how we can type it and analyze it and, and then code up parts of it. So the quote says, we will say that f of x approaches the limit L as x approaches A. And we write, well, this expression, um, if the following condition is satisfied. And then it starts to write something in logic, but with text. So for every number epsilon greater than zero, there exists a number delta greater than zero, possibly depending on epsilon, such that blah, 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 uh, then x belongs to the domain of f and this condition should hold. And if you want to sort of make sense of this, it's good to try to translate it to a uh, more controlled language, not just flowing text. So if we take away most of the words and go towards using logic as the language, then this is what remains. So the uh, syntax for the limit expression, and then it says if, and I use the for all symbol, epsilon greater than zero, the exists delta greater than zero. And then it says such that if, I didn't know exactly how to translate that yet. And then we have this condition and then in symbols, x should belong to the set, which is the domain of f. And, and here is um, this expression, which basically says the distance between f of x and l should be at most, well, it should be less than epsilon. And if we want the intuition here, this says that if we wiggle around a bit, we take x close to a, but not exactly a, then f of x should be close to l but not exactly L. So we have a limit, a certain error in a sort of accuracy in the X direction, and we have another accuracy in the F of X direction. And if we can, for every accuracy, as small as we like it, we can always find a delta, then this limit is defined. Okay, so the first attempt at translating this to some logic expression. So this, this looks perhaps like Haskell, but it's actually not Haskell because you cannot write for all and exists in Haskell. So it's um, pseudocode, it's some logic language. It's more of mathematics. But I try to write it so that, that it looks like a, a functional programming definition. So we have the limit and I've changed a little bit from the previous slide. Here it says x arrow a f of x in L, but the important components here are a, f, and L. So I've taken those a, f, and L as arguments to a predicate. So a predicate in logic that's something that can be false or true. And uh, de it's depending on what a, f, and L are, are sent in here, it can be false or true. Okay, so then it's defined to be for all epsilon exists delta. And then I've defined a little helper predicate P here. That's a local definition. P of epsilon and delta is, and then what we had before. And we used an implication arrow here for the text such that if then, that seems reasonable to use an implication arrow. If this holds, then this should hold. Okay, so as this is not Haskell, we can't check if it's correct in Haskell, so we have to do it by hand. So the first thing to do is what is called scope checking. So scope is about when variables are defined and bound. So the expression here at the end, 
all the variables appearing there have to be named somewhere. So first of all, a, f, and l, they are arguments to lim. So they are bound already in the definition of lim. So that takes care of three of the variables. And then we got a for all, which is a binding construct. So epsilon from the for all, for, from inside this point dot, uh, epsilon is a bound variable. It has, uh, you can think of it as, as having a value. Similarly, exists binds delta, this delta. And then uh, in the local definition, we bind epsilon and delta again. So in here, we bound A, F, L, epsilon, and delta. And then we should check, is there anything left? Is there anything missing? And if we try to see got zero, well, that's well-defined. Less than is well-defined. This is the absolute value that's well-defined. Subtraction is well-defined. But what is x? So x has not been mentioned anywhere here. A, F, L, epsilon, delta. So A, x is sort of hanging loose here. So there is something fishy going on. We have to decide. So we can go back and look at the text. Um, and just, it just said such that if this, then that. But it never said if how x came into the picture. So this is a very common but rather subtle uh, peculiarity of mathematical text that sometimes when you say if then, the condition has a hidden quantifier. So a quantifier that's like for all and exists and so on. And in this case, the, the hidden quantifier is a for all. So we actually need to add for all x for this to make sense. So now we bind a, f, l, epsilon, delta, and x. Because otherwise, if we don't bind x, it will not be well-defined, the, the whole uh, predicate. And then I just made up another name, q, here, for the three-argument predicate taking epsilon, delta, and x which now is well scoped. So X, A, Delta are all defined and also these uh, F, L and Epsilon are available in the context. Okay, so this is, this is a way of coding up the predicates and hopefully one might in the computer be able to check for particular AFL if it holds, but it's not necessarily implementable. The lessons learned here is one needs to be careful with scope and binding, in this case of X. And, um, yeah, well, there, there, one can also analyze the types here to see that epsilon is a real number greater than zero, delta as well, and X is a real number. But we, we will not go into details of the typing here because we've done that a bit before. What I would like to look at is the typing of lim. So actually... I have here written three different possible types of limit. So I've made them a little bit different. So this is a red underlined limb, this is a blue underlined limb, and this is a black limb. So, and I call them limb prop, limb maybe, and limb sloppy. So in actual mathematics text, the sloppy version is mostly used. So what the sloppy version is, is doing here is to saying if you have a an A and an F, then you compute the limit. So the limit is the L that comes out of it. And that uh, conforms to the notation we saw before. Um, maybe a little more Haskell-like, you might remember that use the data type maybe yesterday. Maybe is for things where it might be a value, it might not. So you can have just a value or nothing. And as we know, not all functions have limits at each point. It's more fair to say that actually this function lim returns maybe a y. If it has a limit in this point, it returns that limit. Otherwise, it says nothing. And then the third variant is the one we actually showed on the previous slide, which has three arguments. So a, f, and l. And then it becomes a proposition, something which is true or false. So here we cannot compute the limit. We can only check if we have a hunch, well, the limit might be two, then we can put in two as the third argument and then we will get true or false out. 
Here we also have the types of the other components. So X is a subset of the real numbers. Y is a subset. A is some value in X that we want to look at the limit for. L is a potential limit of type Y. And then the function goes from X to Y. So we could write F from real to real if X and Y are the full sets of real numbers. But it's, it's a little more easy to see the different um, properties or different uh, roles the variables play if we see that ah this is something that comes as an input to the function and this is something that is an output of the function so this must be a and this must be l and this must be the limit okay so let's analyze a little further I will not prove these properties but it's straightforward from the definition to prove that if we take this proposition version of lim and we have as a condition that L1 and L2 are both limits of the same function f at the same point a. So then we can actually conclude that L1 and L2 are equal. So this is saying that lim as a predicate, um, it's a motivation for why we can use the blue or the black one, because we can only, if we get two different values, well, they are actually not different. They are the same. And functions always have to return the same value for the same inputs. And then the third is sort of connecting the three. So if L is a limit of F at A, then the blue version would return just L, and the black version, the sloppy version, will return L. So this is the sort of way to connect these three variants. And if we look at the black version and apply it to one argument, so it has already got the X, the A here of type X, then it takes a function to a limit. And this function, lim A, the partially applied function, is linear. And what does it mean? Well, normally linear means that if you add things, if you add arguments, then you should add the results. And if you scale arguments, you should scale results. And that's the case it means here as well. It's just that adding here is some different thing than adding over on the right. Because the limit, that's just a real number. But the function is not a real number. So adding functions is not the same thing as adding variables, uh, adding real numbers. So then the question arises, what is this O plus? So usually the, with the ring around the plus, you could call it O plus. Well, the first step is when you ask what something is, is to look at its type. So we know that F has type X to Y and G also has type X to Y because they are the second argument to lim. And the second argument to lim always has type x to y. So that's the first argument to plus and the second argument to plus. But then the result of adding up these two functions is sent to lim as a second argument to lim. So this result also has to be of type x to y. So, okay, we know what type it has. So what could it possibly do? Well, there are not many choices actually. So if we want to add the function f to the function g, it should be a function. That's what this type indicates. And it takes an x of type x. And then, well, the reasonable thing to do is to run f to run g and add up the results. So f of x is a real number. g of x is another real number. And the sum is a real number. And those are all of type y. So this local uh, lambda expression is the definition of the O plus for F and G. So in that way, we can add functions on the left-hand side and add normal things on the right-hand side. Okay, and where, why, why is it relevant that it's linear? Well, I won't go into details here, but in the course we go further and, and conclude from this later that, that the computing the derivative is also a linear operator. And we will look at the other half of defining the derivative now. So this is now the second quote for today's lecture. 
its math quote from the same book, and it says that derivative of a function f is another function, f prime. So notice here, it doesn't say f of x or f prime of x. It really says f because that's the function and f prime is another function. And then it says, okay, how is f prime defined? Well, if you give it an x, the value should be defined by this limit. And here we're back to this, the classical mathematical notation for the limit, which we will try to avoid because we want to be uh, checking the types corresponding to what we've done in the previous slides. But uh, we will start from this and then try to make it look a little more like Haskell. So the first step is that the, the task of this definition is to compute the derivative. And as they say, the derivative of f is another function. The derivative computation is also a function, a higher order function. And right now, the only notation in the definition area is a prime, and that's a little bit hard to, to read. So I will instead call it capital D. So D of F is the same as F prime. So this left-hand side here, D F X, is the same as F prime of X, the left-hand side there. Okay, and now I'm trying to use the black, the sloppy version of the limb, which has a, a point. Um, where we take the limit and the function. And then we have to see, okay, what is the point? Well, actually the limit is when age approaches zero. So A here is zero. And what is the function? Well, it's not F. So the function we take the limit of is this expression. So we can define the function G here saying, well, if you give me an age, I will compute this quotient. So notice here, the type of age is basically all real numbers except zero. Because if we would get age to zero, this will be undefined. So we, we can uh, compute the limit when age goes to zero, but it's not defined for exactly zero. Okay, so the, the quotient is the usual one for derivatives. We take the value a little bit away from x at x plus age and subtract the value at x. So that's the difference in the y direction if you have an xy graph. And age is the difference in the x direction. So x plus age minus x is age. So the difference divided by the difference means that this is the slope of the function. The slope of um, um, segment between two points on the function. And when age becomes smaller and smaller, this will approximate the tangent, which is the derivative. Okay, so G has type, well, G is a function. It has type age to Y, where age is all real numbers except zero. Okay, so that's the first step. Let's then try to step-by-step step look at this definition and see if we can make some reusable component because this G here, it's a local definition and it doesn't have X as an argument, which may be a little strange because X is used in the definition. So let's add X as an argument. And if you look at the first line here, where it before, before said G, it now says Phi of X. So I just defined Phi such that Phi of X is the previous G. So now we have X as an argument but the fact that it's phi of x in the limit computation means that x will not change when we take the limit. Only age will change. Okay, and if you look at the types to make this work out, it means that phi takes an x and returns a function from age to y, a function we can use in the limit computation. And Actually, we can make use of the composition, the function composition operator. This was a dot in Haskell. It's a, a mathematics, it's usually written as an, a ring. So this is a function, lim zero, phi is a function, and we have an x argument here and an x argument there, and we can get rid of those and just say, well, the derivative function is phi composed lim zero. So this is just a simplification to make sure that we can define in the same vein as we had before the function f prime 
to the function derivative of f. And this is that function. Okay, we're almost done in extracting a reusable top level function here, but there is still one argument that phi doesn't see. So we have a local definition of phi and it uses the f up here and it's not visible as an argument. So let's change it again. So now we'll invent yet another function name. I call it psi. So phi is equal to psi applied to f. So now we'll have to be careful. We have a three argument function psi. Psi of f, x, and age is this uh, quotient. It's the same quotient all the time, but now psi has all of the arguments in place. So now it doesn't have to be a local definition. It's a top level thing we can analyze separately and it has nice properties of linearity, for example. So the linearity of derivative, which we'll not go through here, comes from the fact that limit is linear and psi is linear. Anyway, this is a way of illustrating the types here. So when we have a function composition, so we sort of apply one function and then another function. Then if we start at the value x, we apply the first function and we get a function h to y, we apply limit at zero, and then we get the limit y. And that the derivative is defined as the composition of these two functions. So d of f is here the annotation, the label on the arrow between x and y. And that means that the derivative of f has type x arrow y. OK, uh, so the, the capital D here is something we cannot implement in Haskell. Uh, but if we want to, we can specify it and we can check some properties. For example, if we have squaring, doubling, and the constant two function, then the derivative of squaring, which is the capital D of how to square, is actually uh, two times, which is double. So we that's from what well, is assumed to be known from other places. And if we take a second derivative of squaring, that's the derivative of squares derivative, the derivative of double, which is the constant two function. So these are properties that hold for, for this function. And the thing is that we cannot implement D of this type in Haskell or in any programming language, by the way, because it will need to have something more than just a function. It will need to know how the function is defined. So we can approximate it. And I will look at this a little bit in the live coding very soon. But we cannot compute the actual derivative unless we have the source code of f. And how do we get the source code of f? Well, instead of analyzing the full Haskell source code, we will implement our own little DSL embedded in Haskell. So our own domain-specific language for simple functions and then we can implement symbolic derivative. And that's what we will go to in the live coding now. So I'm, let's clear here. Um, I'm now in another file than yesterday. Um, and what I want to do here is motivate the need with working with syntax. I've sort of already done half of it, but I will do it a little more from another point of view here. Remind you about the DSL definition and define a DSL for functions. And using this, we should be able to define a syntactic derivative function, deriv. So this is takes a symbolic function to a symbolic function. And it's similar to the D, which takes a semantic function to a semantic function, where the type semantic function uh, is real to real. So this cannot be implemented, but this can and will be implemented. OK, so the first thing is that, well, if we only have an F in our hands, uh, of, for, for this, uh, the motivation why it can't be done. We can't know if this is a sum or a product or whatever it is. And we only have derivative rules for those different cases. So we cannot 
we, we might naively attempt to do pattern matching on semantic functions, but this does not work. And then we might say, okay, let's use this lim and psi from the slides. So we will look at this a little bit and I will now introduce the three functions I had in the last slide, squaring, doubling, which I call tv for twice here and constant two. So let's see if I square three, it's nine, if I do twice three, it's six. And if I do constant two of three, it's two, not very surprisingly. Okay, and then I define this psi function. So remember it took a function from X to Y, a point X, an age, a small epsilon sort of, and it computes the slope locally. Oops. And this is a, a very concrete function. I can try to um, to apply it to some example function like squaring. It will lead us astray, but it's a good example to try. So this t1 is a function, so we can apply it to three, but then we don't get much of a visible result because it also wants a, an age. So if you apply it to three and 0 0.1, then we get the slope near three which is apparently 6.1. If we have a, a larger step, it's seven. If you have an even smaller step, it gets closer to six. So it looks promising here that perhaps we can actually compute in Haskell the limit by sort of letting the limit, letting the age become 10 times smaller repeatedly until it stabilizes. Unfortunately, due to rounding error, this doesn't quite work. And I'd written a little example code here, which does exactly this. So it starts with uh, h being one, and then one tenth, one hundredth, a thousandth, and so on. So one ten times smaller all the time. And we can see that it gets closer and closer to six. Here it's really close to six. And here suddenly it goes the wrong way. And then it stays the same and then it becomes worse and worse and worse and suddenly it's zero, exactly zero and it, it stays exactly zero. So if we would use the idea that, okay, compute the um, difference here and make the age smaller and smaller and smaller until it stabilizes, well, then it will stabilize at zero. And then we say, oh, we found the derivative, the derivative of a squaring function is zero, but that's not true. The squaring function at three has a derivative, which is two times three, which is six. And we get closer and closer to six for a while, but then it sort of goes wrong. And we, we know why it goes wrong. And that's because in the computer, we have only a, a approximate representation. So we have what is called floating point values. So we can't compute exact quotients. And the smaller numbers we get and then subtract these, then the, the error will be more and more important. And finally, it will be the error is so big that the complete the result is completely gone. That's the zeros we get at the end. So this illustrates that it's not really possible to compute the derivative exactly using, well, not just using Haskell, but using any of the languages. We have to do something different from this numerics. I should say that if we seriously have to compute the derivative and we don't have the syntax, we could try to say, okay, we know the precision of the of the floating point and we can stop, say, after a few steps here with a sufficiently small epsilon and tolerate an error. So that's, that's an option, but uh, we will want to do better than that. Okay, but anyway, we, we can express the limit computation um, the problem is that the limit at zero cannot become implemented. And that's the, the reason for that is what I said here, that the smaller we get the age, the bigger problem we'll get with numerical rounding errors um, due to uh, approximation, well, rounding errors. Okay, 
So then we've motivated and we're sort of back up here. It says attempt three, build a domain specific language. And that's what we will spend the rest of this uh, lecture on. And I promised I should remind you what the DSL is. So I have skipped the zeroth part, which was a, a syntax for sort of the textual syntax, which characters should be written. And I jumped directly to a type of syntax tree. And then we need a type of semantic values. And then we need a function, which is an evaluator from the syntax to the semantics. And then we can do things on the syntactic layer and then translate to the semantics at any point. In this case, we want to compute derivatives. And we saw in the slides that derivatives are computed for functions. So we need actually a domain specific language for functions. And more specifically here, we want one argument function expressions. So we had yesterday complex number expressions, and now we have one argument function expressions. And the reason I, I stress this one argument is because we only talk about here derivative in one variable. We can do partial derivatives for uh, n argument functions, but that would be too much to cover in this lecture. Okay, so I will start filling in things here. And just to be um, concrete, we, we could start saying, what's an example of a syntactic function? Well, we could have the function squaring. So if we say that all the functions we're interested in the squaring function, then, well, we've, we've done. We've just said, OK, all functions are, there's just one function that that's called squaring. And it will not be, I mean, we will extend it later, but we can see if we want to implement this, what should we do to write the evaluator? What's the meaning of squaring? So the evaluator has to have one case for each case here. We will add more cases later. So the squaring function semantically is the squaring function. So here I have a capital S, which is just a constructor name. And here I have the lowercase s, which is the square function that I defined before. And you notice here, I got sem f equal to real to real. So the evaluator translates from the syntax to the semantics, and it looks like it does nothing. So let's see now if we can use it. So the evaluator of squaring is, well, okay. It's a semantic function. What can I do with the semantic function? Well, I can apply it, for example, to three. If I apply it to three, I get nine. So here we can see that uh, eval of SQ is a function that I can apply things to, but um, eval can analyze its structure to, to do this. Okay, now I could simultaneously um, try to give some example of derivative. So I have down here, which is actually barely visible. So let's let's scroll up a bit. I've said that I also want to compute a derivative. And now I will compute a syntax tree for the derivative. So then we say, OK, what's the derivative of squaring? Hmm. Well, now suddenly we should have twice the function twice here, because otherwise we can't implement derivative of squaring. So derivative of squaring should be the function twice. And now we can say, OK, evaluate the derivative of squaring. And it says, hmm, it's a function, apply it to three. And it says, oh, oh non-exhaustive patterns. So what's happened here is that we've written the evaluator for squaring. And then we added another constructor twice, but we haven't implemented it. So let's add another case. OK, now we can evaluate the derivative of the squaring function at 3, or for that matter, at 17, or at minus 3, and so on. So of course, this is not a very useful data type for simple functions. I mean, it, it only has basically two functions, squaring and twice. So uh, we can extend it with the, the next natural step, C2 which is the constant two function, but it is a little bit silly. Why, why, why just constant two? We can be more general than that. We can say constant 
real or just to yeah let's let's have constant real so what would be constant r what would the evaluation of constant r be i should just now check also uh, well okay i have to say error to do well i mean it has to be a function so it has to take x in but it should always return r so it's the constant function that always returns r and now if we want to compute, say, the derivative of twice, okay, the derivative of twice doesn't work because we've extended the data type with twice and constants, but we haven't extended the derivative computation. So let's do that. Derivative of twice equals constant two. And let's check. Derivative of twice is constant two. And evaluating derivative of twice is a function applied to three, is two applied to 17 or 18, is two, it's always two. Okay, so we're getting a little more general here, but having twice and squaring as cases is a little bit silly. Uh, a more general case we should have is addition, multiplication, and the variable x. Remember, we had one variable, one argument function expression. So let's, let's add x as the variable. So then it's a question, how do we evaluate x? So the idea of x here should be to return the input. So it's actually taken x in, and return x. So it's the identity function. And that's three. Evaluate x at 17 is 17 and so on. So what can we um, do for the derivative of x? Well, the derivative of x, x is the function which is slope one everywhere. So it's constantly one, the derivative. Okay, so this I will actually put at the start of the derivative computation because this is basically the, the base case, the, the most important case. I will move it up there as well and, and, and start with x here as well. So in fact, the constants, x and constants are more important than squaring and twice. So I'll move up constants as well. And uh, oh, we can see here, we have de defined derivative for x squaring and twice, but we haven't defined derivative for constant functions. So constant function returning r, well, it's a flat function, it's always r. So its derivative is always zero. So its derivative was also a constant function returning zero. Okay, so now we can compute the derivative of squaring. We can compute the derivative of the derivative of squaring. And we can even compute the third derivative of squaring, which is then constantly zero everywhere. The first derivative is twice, the second derivative is constant two, and the third derivative is zero. Okay, well, we only have what is called base cases here. We have sort of a list of possible functions, but it will be a very, very long list if you want to extend it with everything we might want. So the only general case is, is this constant, that because it has a real parameter. So what we would like to do, or we would like to be able to do, is to add functions. So we have two functions, we should be able to add them together. And the first question then is, so let's let's move these down a bit because I think squaring and twice are a little bit special cases that we can take remove later. Um, so evaluation of an addition of an f expression and a g expression. 
And now is the question, what would be the semantics of this? Well, it's always a good idea to use this idea of wishful thinking. Wishful thinking being recursion, being saying, okay, let's let's assume we have already evaluated FE and GE. So we have, we have eval of FE and we have eval of GE. So that's those are two functions. And then we want to add these functions together. And I will now say, okay, let's assume we have a function dot plus, which does this addition. So the first we can do is to check if Haskell likes it, likes it in the sense of type checking. So the type works. It means that if we can implement this dot plus thingy, then we will have solved the addition case. And I, I placed the dot plus here. So notice that add up here, I can put that in a comment. Add has type syn f to syn f to syn f. And if I line up this up, you can see that the the difference is just that we replaced everywhere the syntax with semantics, syntax with semantics, syntax with semantics, but it has the same shape. So this function f plus g is actually what we called o plus, called o plus in the slides. So it, it's supposed to add two functions together and it can do this by taking an argument, applying f to x and adding it to applying g to x. So this works out type-wise and now we can try to give some example. And I would actually say e1 here is add x x. Okay, so if you evaluate E1, we get a function. We can evaluate that at three. Okay, so what function is this? So at three, it has value six. At 17, it's value 34. At one, it has value two. Well, actually, this is the same as twice. So we add X to, together, then we get twice. So that means I think actually we can now remove twice. We've covered it in another way. So I will cut away twice from these different definitions and from the derivative definition. But we should now, if we manage to evaluate, evaluate the addition, we should also be able to de compute the derivative of the addition. So add the function expression Fe and GE. And here as well, if we can compute a derivative of Fe and we can compute a derivative of GE, we should then combine them together to a function. But notice that these expressions are syntactic. So we can't use dot plus here. I can try and then it will say, well, okay, uh, I should remove that case as well. It would just say that you can't match synf with semf. So I need to add syntactic things together. And that is what the constructor add is doing. So now it works. And now I can take compute the derivative of E1. So notice that E, well, I can Evaluate it here. E1 is add xx, and derivative of E1 is add constant 1, constant 1, which I guess should be simplified to constant 2. But be, to be very clear here, we haven't implemented the simplifier. We're just doing exactly the, the thing which is required so far. OK, and I mentioned that we would like to have not only addition, but also multiplication. So we can add another constructor and we can copy this case and write instead mul and then we need a dot star operator. Something very similar to dot plus and we say a function uh, sorry. so f times g is a function that takes x to 
f of x times g of x. So I, if I want to see the, the similarity here, I can put them next to each other. And indent similarly. OK. So dot plus and dot star have exactly the same type. But in one case, it's addition. And one the other case, it's multiplication. OK. And now we can write another example. We can say E2 is mul xx, which should be the same as squaring. Oops. Ah. Okay. Let's load this. Look at E2 and then say evaluate E2, which is a function at 3 is 9. It's x times x where x means, in this case, 3. And I mean, 17 is 289 and so on. OK, and now we also need to implement the derivative for multiplication. And actually, well, I, I should say, as this is the same, I should say this is the same as squaring, then I will also remove the squaring constructor, because it's, it's a bit silly to have a squaring constructor when we already know how to express it more generally. So then we need the derivative of the multiplication of Fe and Ge. And then first, let's write it roughly here. So if we had a function, if we wanted to compute the derivative of F dot times G, so dot times, because that's the operator here for, for multiplying functions. So we know from from uh, calculus that this should be the derivative of f times g plus f times derivative of g and now if i if i was should be uh, specific i should have dot times and dot plus and dot times there so this is derivative of the first and then not derivative of the second, but the first and, and then derivative of the second. That's the usual derivative rule. And now we have to sort of translate this to what we should do on the syntactic side. So D, if this, we, we keep this line and then we said D should be deriv. So everywhere it says D, it should say instead deriv. So D there is also deriv. And uh, Let's indent a little bit to so see if we can keep the, the symmetry here. So the addition here is actually the constructor add. So instead of dot plus, we use add. And the multiplication must use mul. So it's perhaps not that easy now to see the correspondence, but if I indent it, it might be possible to see roughly how they sort of match up. So derivative, yeah, okay. Well, actually I should, I should do mal here as well, mal fg. So derivative of mal fg should be this expression. So let's copy that one up. And now the only thing different is I call the F F E here. So let's write F E G E F E and G E. And that was just to keep track of which one had which type. So F expression is not the same as F as the function. Okay, interesting. Now, can we compute the derivative of the example E2? So let's look. So first, e2 is mul xx. And then this rule will say it's an addition of a multiplication of the derivative of x, which is 1 with x, and then multiplication of x with a constant 1. So yes, it is correct. It might not be very pretty. Because, I mean, if I, if I take this expression um, down here, this is actually... Uh, 
equal to the addition of multiplication of constant 1 and x and multiplication of constant 1 and x. So the same multiplication twice, which should be the same as the multiplication of constant 2 and x. But I currently don't have a simplifier to implement this. It's an interesting exercise, and it can definitely be done to make a simplifier. So something like simplify, which takes a syntax tree, oh, sorry, to a syntax tree. And I will just say here, error homework. <laughs> Difficult at this stage. <laughs> But it's it's definitely doable. You can uh, simplify these different patterns and, and make them then go away. OK, but let's see what we have so far. So we have implemented up here a data type, which has x, constants, addition, and multiplication. So we can write rather complicated expressions. Perhaps I should give e3 and e4 as uh, other examples as well. So let's say now we add uh, the multiplication of E1 and E2 with, uh, well, X or whatever. And then we say we multiply E3 by E3. Right. So E4 here is now a rather big expression. It's not a very useful expression perhaps, but it's something. We can evaluate it at 3, say, or 2, or 1, or 0, so on. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a polynomial, actually. And um, we can also compute the derivative of E4. It's not a very readable expression. This is where you really would like to simplify it to kick in. But it is sort of, it takes almost no time. Uh, it, you can add the simplify to the later, and it shows what kind of things you can do when you've got a domain-specific language as a syntax, an evaluator, and the semantics. And then suddenly you can start doing symbolic computations, such as computing derivatives. Okay, so to sum up, the mini course, course conclusions is that we have talked about domain-specific languages, DSLs of math. We did a short introduction to program functional programming in Haskell, very short introduction, just an hour. Um, we've been formalizing or implementing some textbook domains and with domain examples, first example was complex numbers, but we'd implemented the syntax, the semantics and the val function for uh, complex numbers and then these simple functions we talked about today. Also syntax, semantics, eval, but also the symbolic derivative. They are called the deriv. And uh, this and much more is available online. There is a playlist with lectures from the full course instance from 2022. Um, there is source code repository with all these examples, all the 17 exams of the course, including solutions, if you want to study on your own or ask questions, and the full PDF of the course book, which of course can also be bought on paper, but if you just want to look at it online, then the source code is there and the links are available. And um, yeah, this was uh, the contents of lecture three, which concludes the course and we can take uh, questions.